actually speaking to you today from Portugal because we came for the Christmas break and we got stuck here, which is not a bad place to be stuck in. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be part of this winter school um, and I'm sure that the energy will be there as well, even though we're online. Um, I always like to see the faces on the screen and feel that I'm not just talking to a screen, but there's people on the other side as well. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really happy to be part, part of this great lineup of um, speakers focusing on inclusive education that you'll be um, lucky to hear in the coming days. Um, it's, it's really great. As Oscar said, um, I, I'm in, in the University of Glasgow. I coordinate the Masters in Inclusive Education. Originally, I trained to be a teacher in Portugal, uh, primary and lower secondary Portuguese and French teacher. Um, and issues around equity um, and how could teachers teach Chinese students who arrived to Portugal without any language knowledge, for example, was always something that puzzled me uh, from the classroom side. Um, and as Oscar said, when I finished my first degree in Portugal, I went to the UK for a one year masters and then many years later, <laughs> I'm still in the UK, a bit more north now. Um, but it's, it's a country that I think in terms of education and inclusive education, uh, in Scotland is a very, very interesting um, place. And I'll, I'll speak to you briefly about that. I'll try and share my screen. I've got some PowerPoint slides that hopefully will make it a little bit more um, visual as well, so that you don't just listen to me for a long time. Um, and when I was uh, looking at the program and thinking, okay, I go first, what do I do? I thought I'll, I'll go through some of the basic concepts and ideas. And I think what you will find is that inclusive education is a very wide topic. And depending on who you're speaking to, there will be different um, nuances. For example, when we talk about integration, if we talk from a cultural and linguistic side, it's something that's still very, a concept that's still very commonly used. Um, if you're talking from a disability side, integration is some, seen as something a little bit more negative. So I thought I'll start with some of the concepts and I'll start with a question because I know a lot of your focus in the program is around policy and policies. Um, and I think that the question for today's session is, if we want to create more inclusive education systems, do we go from policy to practice and that's the way it will work? And hopefully through the, the presentation, we'll be able to um, formulate some ideas around this question. So there's three main aspects, three main parts to my presentation. The first one, I'll talk about some of the key concepts, some of them quite big and heavy, and I'll summarize them in a very, very short way. Um, but hopefully you'll be familiar with some of them. Hopefully you'll be curious Como? and go away and read more about them. The inclusion educativa. Oh. Can you just turn off the mm -hmm. microphones, please? Good concepts. Podéis, podéis cerrar los micrófonos, por favor, quien quiera que esté hablando. Gracias. Sorry. It's okay. So the second part, we'll think about policies um, and what are the key international policies and what this means in acting policy. And then in the final and shorter section, we'll think briefly about practice. Um, and the, the, the way I've thought about this is looking at the other speakers, I think you'll, you will get all the different bits of the puzzle throughout the week. So I'd like to start by asking you to, um, let me try and get the link on the chat. So you can click on the link or you can go to Menti um, and let me get the Zoom. Um, and what I'd like you to do is in three words to write what inclusive education means to you. Thinking about your background, your research, what you've done, what does it mean to you? Let's see if I can 
paste the link there. It will make it easier. Um, otherwise, you can just go to menti.com and write the code 4765662. And that should create a word cloud with some of the ideas. So what are the key things that you think when you think about inclusive education? What are the key concepts? Um, let me share the right screen now. These are some of the things that would be easier in a room. So pause, share, and I'll share another screen so you can see. So hopefully now you could you can see the word cloud appearing. We've got diversity, equality, exclusion, special schools. So already we can see no one left behind, ability. Um, so we've got already a lot of concepts coming up, which clearly shows the huge um, field that we're talking about when we talk about inclusive education. And depending on which side you approach it, you see different things. There are, however, key concepts. And it's really interesting because I think we can see them in, in the cloud. I mean, diversity is definitely one of the key aspects. Equity, um, participation. So it, it's, it's really interesting to see what you, you came up with, okay? And hopefully some of these, I think most of these concepts will come up in the presentation. So if I now go back to our PowerPoint. I would start by saying that inclusive education is a journey. And as with any journey, you know where you start. Most of the times, you know where you're leaving from. Um, different people leave from different places. Sometimes you're not sure what, when or where you'll get to the place where you want to get. Um, and depending on which means of transportation you choose, um, you will get there faster or in a more polluting way. Or So inclusive education is about this path, is about this process, and it's a challenging process. It's something that, and I think this is really important, collaboration is essential if you want to really develop inclusive education. Collaboration between different members of staff, collaboration with students, collaboration with parents. This is something that we need to work together. We need to listen to different voices, sometimes voices of people that we're not um, used to listen to. Um, and I really like this diagram from the International Bureau for Education that reminds us that educa inclusive education is a process. And according to this document, there's four main aspects that we need to work on if we want to develop more inclusive education systems. The first one are the concepts. We'll talk about some of these concepts later on. Concepts and the way we talk about things have an impact on the way we think. If we talk about special needs or if we talk about um, additional needs or diversity, it will create different meanings in the ways we respond to students. The second aspect are policies and policies have a huge impact on the concepts we use. So for example, if I think of England and Scotland, in England, the concept usually, um, one of the concepts linked to inclusive education is SEND, so special education needs and disabilities. If you go up to Scotland, you won't find any policy documents that refer to SEN. Um, what you have is additional support for learning or additional support needs. And this has an impact in the way people think. Um, so policy plays a key role. Um, also in the third aspect of structures and systems, policies very often dictate how schools look like um, whether which types of schools we have, um, which types of teachers do we have, special, te special education teachers and mainstream teachers, or do we have 
teaching assistants. So all of this is heavily influenced by policy. The final one and the structures and the systems, I think it's very easy to see how huge an impact they have, because if you go to school in uh, rural India um, and you're a girl, or if you go to school in a large city in the UK, the structures and the systems in terms of education you will find will be very different and that will have an impact on your experience of education. In the masters that I coordinate, I work mainly with teachers um, and I always tell them that you can work in a context in a country where the concepts and the policies and the structures are not very inclusive, but you can still work at the level of practice. You can still create an inclusive ethos in your classroom. Similarly, if you're now thinking about research, you can, for example, um, work in a context where there aren't many um, ethical approval procedures or all of that, but you, in your practice, you can still work on the basis of participatory research, um, listening and trying to portray the voices of certain groups who are sometimes disadvantaged. You'll probably hear from the speakers that you'll hear in the coming days, you'll hear different definitions and different versions of what inclusion in education means. I um, like to think that there are three main aspects when you're thinking about inclusion. And the three main aspects are, the first one is access. And access traditionally would think about physical access. Does the school have a ramp or a lift? Actually, what we're thinking about when we talk about inclusive education nowadays, it's a much wider notion of access. If I've got a student that comes to Scotland without any English language knowledge, and we put the student in a classroom, he or she won't understand anything of what's going on, he will or she will not be accessing education. He will be there, but accessibility will, will not be in place. The second concept, key concept is participation. And this is on one hand, taking part in things because you can be in a classroom, but sitting at the back with a teaching assistant supporting you full time and you're not really taking part in anything that's going on in the classroom. It also has the more um, individual side, experiential side, which is feeling part of something. For example, nowadays or today, we're all in different parts of the world looking at a screen, but hopefully you'll feel part of Globed, you'll feel part of something. You're participating. Um, and the final one, final aspect is success. And this will mean very different things to different people. If you've got a student with a learning um, disability who will never be able to read, for example, that student's notion of success will be very different from a highly able student who needs to be pushed or um, kind of taught more things to keep interested in what's happening in school. So the notions of success are very different to different students, but it's very important that everyone succeeds in their education, that everyone is doing something that's meaningful to them as well. Because if you think about it, being in a school or being in a, any educational setting, you can just be there physically, but, but not really take much from it. In that case, that would not be an example of inclusive education. And the key thing is that this should apply for all, all students, not just the kind of the comfortable majority of students, not just the students with certain labels, but all the students should be able to access, to participate and to succeed in education. Sometimes we think about this um, path from exclusion to inclusion as a historical development. And it can be, because if we think about it, we started by creating schools, 
that were only aiming to teach certain groups of students. Um, and there were lots of excluded students who would stay at home if you had a disability or um, stay at home if you're a girl in some countries, Global South, and you have your period. So lots of reasons why you'd be excluded. Historically, we got to a point that we said, actually, that's not OK. We need to ensure education for all. Um, so let's create special schools for certain groups of students. And that's what we call segregated settings. So you've got the mainstream and you've got other settings um, for teaching specific groups of students. We then moved on to what we called integration. And that's when we had a mainstream school and within that we had, um, for example, a special room or a special unit um, or even students who are brought into the into the mainstream school, but not really, they're not really part of that school. They're part of a subsystem within that school. Um, you'll see in the title that there's one more key concept, which is mainstreaming. And that's when you bring everyone into the mainstream class, regardless of whether they're included or not. Um, the final concept is a concept of inclusion. And the idea of inclusion is that the system will change. So some people have criticized this diagram by saying, look, the school is still this circle and everyone will just have to fit into this circle. Whereas actually, when we talk about inclusion, we should be talking about a school, a, a system, an education system that changes to respond to the needs and to the diversity of their students. I think COVID taught us and showed us that it is possible to have distance um, learning. But up until now, we had lots of students who couldn't physically go to school because they're in hospital, for example, and they would be excluded in some countries because they, the, we, we kept being told, look, no, that's not really possible. Even in higher education, um, that was sometimes the case. Actually, and this is my final point on this slide. I would say that all of these concepts coexist nowadays. They're not a historical development. They exist. Um, we still have lots of exclusion in mainstream schools. We still have lots of segregated settings. And these are concepts that are very useful for us to think about what we see in our contexts. For example, um, the, the, the European agency tried to organize countries into how they organize their education systems. And they said there's countries with a one track approach where everyone is expected to go to mainstream schools. Um, and if you look at the list, it's mainly so Southern and Northern European countries. Um, there's countries with a two track approach where you have two parallel education systems that don't really mix. You've got mainstream schools and special schools and you either go to one or to the other. And then you have countries with multi-track approach and that will be the case for, for example, Scotland and England um, where you have special schools and mainstream schools and um, co-located schools that have the same building, but there's ac there are actually two schools. You've got special units within mainstream. So you've got a multi-track approach. You've got all of these. And for example, the case in Scotland, there are students who go to a special school two days a week and a mainstream school three days a week, because that's the placement that was thought to be the best for that individual student. So already you can see that a two track approach is a segregated, um, so students are segregated depending on the labels they are given. Um, another one, cause I don't like to speak to her too long. Um, I'd like you to go back to that link. Um, and now, hold on. Think about your experiences in school. Um, think about when you were a student, okay, or when, or even now, 
and think which students or groups of students are were excluded from your education system, an education system you're familiar with. Um, so hopefully if you go back to the to that same link, you should be able to see you should be able to see the, the second question. It's just to, to have a feel for what um, what groups you felt were excluded. So we've got already different um, groups coming up. Indigenous, refugees, depending on where you live, rural areas, um, non-native speakers, got socioeconomic class coming up as well, um, Roma, LGBT. So we've got, I think, many of the concepts that come up when we want to develop more inclusive systems, sometimes we focus on one of these groups. And what we're saying, um, and I think what the international trend is, is to say, actually, it's not okay for any student from any of these groups to be left behind, to be excluded, um, to go to school on a daily basis, but to a school that means nothing to them. So it's really important that we, um, and in your research, you'll probably be thinking about some of these groups um, and how you can give voice to, to, this, to these groups through your research. So you, you came up with many of, the, um, of the, the labels, the categories that we tend to use um, and that we tend to see in, in research. Sometimes, and I'd say um, it's all, always very interesting because sometimes when we talk about inclusive education, we talk about student diversity, but in the back of our mind, there's still a lot of people thinking about special education needs um, and the, the, the more disability linked um, labels and, and categories. I would say, actually, we started when we talked about inclusive education, and if we look, we will look at international policy briefly. Um, we started with um, this idea that we needed to serve disabled students. We needed to respond to their needs, students with disabilities. We then, through the Warnock report, started saying that actually we should be thinking about students with special educational needs, which is a broader term. Within particular contexts, so for example, Scotland, you'll we'll talk about students who we who need additional support for learning, students with additional support needs, and there's this notion that anybody can have additional needs at, at any time of their learning of their schooling experience. Actually, what we're saying is that when we talk about inclusive education nowadays we talk about access, participation and success for all students. So it's a call for a paradigm shift. It's not looking at which individual group um, we need to serve. And then we think, well, we only have funds for a group of students. So let's just focus on students with disabilities. Um, we don't really care about students with EAL because we don't have funds anymore. What we're saying when we think about inclusive education is that we need to work on the basis that any student in any given day um, should be able to access learning, to participate and to succeed. Um, we, I, I like that the, um, David Mitchell tried to organize these aspects of diversity into big categories. And he talks about sex and gender differences, social class and socioeconomic status differences, race, ethnicity, cultural differences, 
religions, beliefs, and ability. And these are macro, big, big, big categories um, that can be useful. There's other ways of, of thinking about diversity. And you came up, many of the, I'd say many of the um, um, groups that you came up with and the mentee would fit into this. Depending on what aspect uh, you're focusing on, some of these um, categories will be more or less relevant. So, for example, when I did my PhD, I worked in, uh, I spoke to teachers in Portugal and in, in England, um, and it was really interesting because ability was really what mattered. It was the notion of ability um, that had an impact on whether students needed or didn't need individual planning. Teachers were not very worried about um, gender differences or um, racial, cultural differences. What mattered is, can they learn? Yes, then they're fine. Um, are, do they have difficulties? Then we need to do something about it. So it was more about ability. Some of these concepts of diversity, difference and difficulty sometimes are used interchangeably when we talk about inclusive education. I did a, a Google search, image search for these three um, aspects, the three concepts. Diversity, what you see is a lot of people. It's lots of people um, together with different characteristics. When you search difference, you've got this idea of single, singled out, somebody with a different color, some, somebody with um, different characteristics. And very often within education settings, we talk about difficulties. We worry about students who have difficulties. And very often that's prompting us to look at the individual student and saying, why do you have difficulties? What's wrong with this student? How can we fix this? Um, and this brings us to this idea of difference and difficulty is focusing on the individual as the source of the problem. Lots of the times it's thinking they're not learning, they're struggling, there must be something with them. Um, and I, I, I remember very vividly because the, the teachers I interviewed would very often say, well, they come from a very complex family um, or they um, they just moved to this place. So it was the, the characteristic was within the student. What um, when we think about inclusive education, we're hoping to shift from the discourse of student difficulties and pupil ability, where we think the problem is within the student, to move to discourses of learning potential and think about the curriculum, according to David Skidmore, and thinking about the context. Okay, so if we think about these two um, ways of looking at student characteristics or um, difficulties, we can either go for a tendency to locate the, prob the problem within the pupil, and then we try to fix the pupil witness by doing an extra session, some extra support. Um, we want to transmit content knowledge. Usually we break it down into steps. We've got individual education plans that break knowledge into smaller steps, and we think that will fix it. Um, the other way of thinking about it is thinking about teaching approaches and strategies as a whole, is looking at the curriculum and how we present it and thinking about pupil engagement. If I think about your, um, your backgrounds, your interest, your um, work that you're developing, probably if inclusive education has nothing to do with anything you're doing, you won't be as motivated it won't be as meaningful. And this will apply to any learning and teaching. So when we think about inclusive education, um, we want to shift from this idea of within 
pupil to shift to a focus on the context and the curriculum. The two, and probably you heard about these two models um, of, of disability, these are models that will were developed thinking about disability, but actually they're very useful when we think about contexts. Um, they're very useful to help us think which way we're responding to student diversity. So the medical model of disability is where we think there's something wrong with a the person, there's an impairment and that's the problem. Um, and we need to treat that impairment. We need to fix the student. You can apply it to other contexts so you can say, well, the problem is um, that the, the, the student doesn't speak English and schooling is in English. So let's fix the student because there's something wrong with that student, okay? And that's the medical model. If you break a leg, if you're running somewhere and you break a leg, you want a medical model response. There's something wrong. There's a broken bone. You want a response to that. And sometimes what we see is that uh, a, a kind of pushed away of this medical model, which should be pushed away when we're talking about other aspects of diversity not a broken bone, you want it fixed, you want a medical model response. But when you're thinking about um, a student, for example, with a sensory impairment, a hearing impairment, um, apart from, you could have hearing aids, you could have um, cochlear implants, you could have um, coil systems in the rooms, those would be in place, but the student could still be excluded from situations. What came as a response to the medical model of disability was the social model of disability. And that came as an opposite, an opposite pull. And it came to say, look, it's not the problem. The problem is not, not that I can hear, that I cannot hear. The problem is what the society, what the context does about it. So, the, the ignorance about it, the fear, the stigma. Um, if we think about cultural diversity, we don't want to fix someone who is from a different background. Yes, we may want to increase their language ability in the language that teaching happens, but we don't want to dismiss, we don't want to kind of say, no, don't speak your mother tongue. What you need is to speak English 24 seven. That's not a good response. What we want is to say, look, let's look at the context. Let's build knowledge around diversity, for example. The social model of disability is saying, look, the problems are all, all in the society. There's nothing wrong with me. And it came with a response to that medical model. It came as a response to disabled people being tired of being looked at as you're the problem, let's fix you. Okay, so it's the, the, the opposite. It's really important as an empowering model, social model of disability. And it links to some of the aspects of inclusive education because what we're asking is a focus on the context rather than just the individual. I really like this cartoon. Um, which says, how do you know I have a, a learning disability? Maybe you have a teaching disability. And sometimes we're very fast at saying, this is the problem. The student has this, the student has that, let's tackle it. But actually, sometimes it's important to turn things on, on their head and thinking, okay, what's going on here? Um, but if you think about it in this cartoon, what you have is still a very medical individualized look at this situation, because we're saying, is it the student's problem or the teacher's problem? And this is not helpful. And it's something that happens a lot. If, you, if you're a year one uh, teacher, um, year one, year two, and your, your students don't know how to read, it's either that the student is, some, has something wrong with them or that your teaching is wrong. And then it's this back and forth, which is really not useful. 
there's always this blame game. The teacher will say, well, the, the policies tell us to do this. The policies will say, well, it comes from up there. It's not us. Um, the press will say, oh, the students are very lazy. They don't work anymore. The students will say, well, my parents don't do that. So it, we have a lot of this blame game in education. We've got a very strong tradition of pointing fingers, which is not helpful. I find it really interesting that there's a, a quote from Michelin Mason and Richard Rieser from 1994, and they're saying what we're doing is still assessing the individual. We don't, we're still not able to remo remove the barriers to inclusion, to look at the barriers, identify them and try to remove them. And what we have in general are education systems that are very difficult to change. That's the way they are. They've always been this way. Why would we do it differently? And so it's always interesting to think um, I like the, the drawing a lot because it says education has the potential to transform the planet, but first we must transform our education systems. Um, some of you might be focusing on marketization, um, and if we look at um, how schools work, it, there is something that if we think of market schools as a market aspect and equity, there's something that clashes. So if we want to create more inclusive schools and settings, what we need to do is to change the focus, to change the focus from the student's characteristics and from the teacher's problems and what they're doing wrong. And what we need to focus on are the characteristics of the context, the organization and the practice. And this will, will be heavily influenced by policies, but not only dictated by policies. That's one of the key aspects. It's looking and identifying barriers. Why is a student being excluded? What are the barriers? Okay. And this leads us to the second part, which is policy. And I'd like to start by saying that when we read a policy, sometimes we forget what goes behind it. Um, and I, I remember Len Barton um, talking about policy and the policy making process as a struggle. Um, and he would always say it's a struggle. It's a struggle between different int interest groups over meanings, participation and practice. Very often policy making involves alliances, tactics, negotiations. What we see in the final document is the product of a lot of work in the background. Um, and it's a very complex and contentious process. So it's important that we have that in mind when we read a policy to try and think what's not there, what's not being said, why isn't there a definition of something that's essential on the topic that you're focusing on? Policies structure the way we think about issues. They can be interpreted, very often they can be interpreted in a, a variety of, of ways. They're left open because very often the different groups don't agree on what should be there. But they're never value free or neutral. Um, they're informed by wider concerns. So you can't really look at a policy in a vacuum. You need to look at who was involved in creating this policy. What was, who were the interest groups? And always think about what's there and what's not there. Why is it weird that some things like, if you're talking about inclusive education, um, the definition of who, who is excluded or who are the students that should be supported sometimes is not there. Why? I also really like this idea of policy as a multi-layered ecology. Um, and Weaver Hightower, Hightower writes about this saying, look, if you look at a policy, think of it as all the different layers. You've got the international policies, sometimes which are influenced by national policies and the other way around. 
and, it, and then you've got local school classroom policies. You've got all of these a little bit like an onion with all the different layers and policies are also like that. If you think of the different interest groups, um, this is a, um, a list of some of the legal frameworks that are relevant to inclusive education from 2009. Um, and if you look at these different documents, you'll see different groups. Some of the groups that came up in your um, answers. So you've got um, human rights as a general one, then you've got racial discrimination, women, tribal peoples, migrant workers, um, cultural, cultural aspects, disabilities, indigenous. So you've got different groups. And it's important that when we look at these policy documents, we think who was behind the creation of these documents. When we think about inclusive education, it's really, I would say at the basis of this is the, the, the idea of human rights. Education is a right um, and inclusive education as education for all is a right. Um, so one of the key documents that I would say policy documents is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. You'll then, um, and um, Xavier, you, you mentioned it earlier, the education for all, um, we usually um, refer to the Salamanca Statement and that was one of the topics in one of the readings um, or the Dakar Framework for Action, the Development Goals. So what we have are different policy documents that will mention or be relevant to inclusive education in different ways. And they were developed by different groups of, of people. So just to, to, to tell you, for example, if I think of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, I would say that the third, um, this third uh, principle the best interest of the children and youth is something that should guide any action and any decision in inclusive education. Because what we're saying is that um, if you're deciding whether a student should go to a special school or a mainstream school or um, a, a special unit or have extra support or not, the decision should not be made on the basis of the parents' interests or the teachers, or it should be made on the best interests of that individual child. And that's really, really important. If we think about the different um, policy documents that I mentioned were relevant, it's interesting to see where they came from. So for example, the John Tim Declaration was um, produced at the at, after the World Conference on Education for All. So the focus was education for all. Um, it then um, resulted in a framework for action that was produced in the World Education Forum, and the, the which is usually called the Dakar Framework for Action. And it's interesting to see that the groups that the, the Dakar Framework for Action is referring to is um, most vulnerable and disadvantaged. Um, and they give the example of girls, children in difficult circumstances, and those be belonging to ethnic minorities. So you've got um, a, a movement which is education for all and has certain groups of students disadvantaged, vulnerable in, in mind. There's a really interesting article, I've put the link there, um, and I'm sure you'll, you'll get access to the PowerPoints later, um, which is specifically focusing on this, um, um, is there a tension between the education for all movement and the educa inclusive education movement? You then have one of the key documents, which is the Salamanca Statement, and it will be talked about again and again. The Salamanca Statement was the outcome of the World Conference on Special Needs Education. So you would expect that the focus, the group of um, students that, that this statement focuses on is those with special needs. 
It links to previous um, international policy documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But what you see is the product of more than 300 participants that got together um, in this conference focusing on special needs education. So already you have two different um, policy doc international policy documents that focus on different groups of students because of who was involved in their um, creation. The, this article by Florian Kupis, um, look, I, I really like the diagram because he shows how we had regular education as a right, um, which developed from 1948 um, in the 90s um, with John Tim, We've got education for all of, as a movement, which continues. And then on the yellow track, you've got from 1965, the development of special education in the 90s, special needs education with a Warnock report, and then with a Salamanca statement, inclusive education. In the 2000s, what we saw was a merge between these two, inclusive education organized in line with education for all. So what, again, what you see is policy documents that have a history and cannot be understood in a vacuum. Two other big policy documents that I'm sure you heard a lot, um, probably especially the, the sustainable SDGs, sustainable development goals. So we came up with a list of eight goals that we really wanted to achieve um, in, um, by the year 2000, um, which were the Millennium Development Goals. And then because we didn't reach them, we thought, let's come up with more goals. And we now have 17 goals that we, we're trying and working towards. But what we see um, in these is education playing a key, a key role. So it's the fourth goal on the SDGs. And what you have is the goal having inclusive education as a key aspect, ensuring inclusive and equity, equitable quality education for all. So you have this notion of inclusive education, not just for specific groups of students, but for all. Um, if you have um, a look at some of the targets, um, you have things like free, equitable, quality primary and secondary education. So for example, one of the debates when we think about special schools is whether the quality of education is the same as in mainstream schools or if it's lower. And if it's lower, that is a problem because you, what you don't want to say, well, you're second class, go to this school where you have lower quality, maybe with less qualified teachers. Um, so the, the, one of the, the targets within the SDGs, one of the, the, the things that we want to achieve is to, to have education facilities that are child disability gender sensitive. Um, so again, you have certain groups, dis disabled students and um, gender aspects being kind of put in, in the highlighting um, place. We have another key um, policy document when we talk about inclusive education, which is the United Nations, um, sorry, <clears throat> Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And it's, again, it, if you look at it through the lenses, if you're thinking, okay, this is a policy, let's see. The focus of the whole policy is disability, okay? You have um, a very um, strong focus on inclusive education in Article 24, which focuses on education. And it says we need to, state par states parties need to ensure inclusive education systems at all levels. We need to ensure that persons with disabilities are not excluded from the general education system and that they can access inclusive, quality, free education in the communities where they live. So what you have here is um, 
some gaps, I would say, in terms of the, the focus. Um, you have in access can, whether persons with disabilities can access um, the schools in the communities where they live. This aspect of accessing is then interesting to question whether it's just the physical access or it's access to learning. If we look, and again, this is what links back to the, um, to the aspect of policies being open. If we look at the reservation um, statement um, and declarations made by the, the um, UK when signing the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, you see the, um, the open door that was left um, was then interpreted by a national government. So what you have is the UK saying, the UK reserves, reserves the right for disabled children to be educated outside their local community if they're more appropriate education provision elsewhere. Um, and they and this links to this side of marketization of education. The parents of disabled children have the same opportunity to state a preference. So the focus is put on parents in terms of choice, parental choice. Um, and it's very interesting because if you go back to this idea of human rights, it's whether the parents' interests will be put at the forefront rather than the children's interests. Um, it then says at, in the very last sentence, the general education system in the UK includes mainstream and special schools. So because it was left open, um, the UK decided to make their own interpretation of what a general education system was. What you then have as a response to this is, um, sorry, this is just to, to give you an overview. It's a really, um, I've, I find it really interesting. The countries that have signed the UN convention and um, the, the ones that have ratified, so you can um, see that lots of countries have um, ratified the convention and protocol. And within the, the website, you can see all the declarations that they made. And it's really, really interesting. Um, so what you can see after that was because of the openness of the UN, the language in the UN convention, what you then have is um, another policy document, which is called general comment number four. Um, on the right to inclusive education. Um, and it's interesting because here there was uh, an attempt to make language a lot more specific, okay? So it says inclusive education is really important. Um, many millions of people with disabilities continue to be denied the right to education. Um, and for many more, it's only available in settings where persons with disabilities are isolated from their peers um, and they receive um, education of an inferior quality. So full effective participation, accessibility, attendance and achievement of all students um, is, is something essential. So you have a already a lot more defined language and they go on to define the key concepts that we covered in the first section. So in the general comment number four, there's a definition of what um, exclusion, segregation, integration and inclusion is. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that with a very open policy, you then have a general comment that tries to bring it down to a more operationalized um, level. What we have, however, and statistics are really important because they allow us to see um, what's going on at the macro level. So for example, these are a little bit dated, but you can see the 
the data for the UK, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and the way they organized it was special schools, special classes in mainstream schools, and inclusive settings. So from the numbers there, you can see, for example, um, that um, Scotland has a lot more inclusive settings than special schools compared, for example, to England or Wales. Um, but then again, if you think about it, it's interesting to question what they mean by these inclusive settings. Should they just say mainstream schools where everybody is supposed to attend? or oh, welcome to attend, because you can't really, and that's one of the big challenges when you're doing research within inclusive education, you can't really tell from big data whether individual students are being included in mainstream schools or not. You can't get to the level of the individual experience. So you need the both sides of research, you need big data, but you also need individual um, experiences. Okay, so we're we're coming towards the final part. I just I talked about this before. Again, if you think of concepts in policies in different parts of the UK, it's interesting to see that special education needs is is the concept used in England, whereas in Scotland you have additional needs, and within um, Scotland you have this vision that who the, in the policy you have, who may require additional support for learning? And you have a list of characteristics. And again, it's important to see that who may require it. It doesn't mean that if you're looked after by a local authority, you will have additional support for learning. You need additional support for learning. It's saying to um, teachers, to schools, look, if you have students who are within these groups, you may need to pay attention. And you have things like more within child disability, things like motor sensory impairments, but you also have things like being bullied, uh, being highly able to, uh, experiencing bereavement. If you think of a student who's just lost a parent, they probably will need some sort of additional support for learning. Within a more traditional way of special education, they wouldn't get any support because they usually, for example, in Portugal, there was a, a very strong focus on it needs to be something long. Um, it needs to be a long-term disability. It can't be something like experiencing a bereavement. But I think everybody um, has experienced some difficult situations in life and you know that you, you do need a little bit more time or a little bit more support, or even sometimes a teacher just asking you, are you okay, you don't look too well. So at the level, that level of the practice can make a huge difference. Um, the general comment number four has a list of features of inclusive education. And what you see is this idea of it's a whole systems approach. Um, it's thinking and redesigning whole education environments and thinking about the whole person. We need to support teachers. Um, it's essential because at the end of the day, it's the teachers who will be with the students on a daily basis. Um, the systems need to be um, developed on the basis of respect for and value of diversity. Um, learning should be at the core. And sometimes we forget we have all the interventions and trying to sort out things and we forget learning should really be um, at the core and that we should develop learning friendly environments. Transitions are always challenging um, and, and so that they're there as well in the, in the list. Partnerships, collaboration between different agencies and the final one, monitoring. So I was, as I was saying, it's really important for us to have data any kind of data is very useful um, for us to understand what's going on. And as the final um, thought in the policy section um, is that we've got the policy documents, they're usually open um, and sometimes um, kind of open to interpretation. 
and what we have in the schools. And if you think of those layers of that multi-layered cake of policy, um, when we enact policy, um, I really like the expression that um, Maguire and colleagues use. That it's sometimes jumbled, ambiguous, messy process. Um, that's experienced on the ground by policy actors. Because as you're implementing policy, you're reinterpreting it. Um, and that leads us to the final, um, final bit, which I decided to focus briefly on practice. And I think Rogers Lee will focus mostly on practice. So I thought I'll just have some, some key ideas here, not only in terms of learning and teaching, but also in terms of research. The first aspect in terms of learning and teaching um, I think very often when we think about inclusive education, we think about a classroom. We think about what happens between teacher and students. Um, there's a guide um, developed by ENET. Um, you can Google it and it's open access. There's lots of videos on YouTube um, about each of these. And the way they organized the, this um, guide was by times of the day. And if you think about it, if you have a student who um, wakes up in the morning, doesn't have any clean clothes, doesn't have breakfast, um, doesn't have the, the right material to go to school, um, has a, a rough moment interaction, family interaction in the morning, when they get to school, they'll probably not be ready to learn. And that's one of the key things. Similarly, in getting to school, um, in the video, you see some countries um, in the global south and how challenging it is for students to physically get to school. And this will have an impact on learning. Arriving at school, do you, do you get noticed? Do you, do you feel welcome? Do you want to, to be in that place? Or is it a, a difficult place for you to experience on a daily basis? So I think it's really important to think that when we talk about inclusive education, it's not a classroom, closed classroom with um, tables and chairs and students and a teacher. It's bigger than that. It doesn't mean that as teachers, we need to fix it all, but it will make a difference. If you think this student's not focusing today, what's going on? Um, maybe I, I can ask, are you okay? And that will make a huge difference again I think maybe one of the speakers in the coming days might talk about dilemmas of difference but I thought it's something so essential when we talk about inclusive education as practitioners teachers researchers you will experience that dilemmas when we when we're dealing with diversity this is something, um, this idea, this concept theory was developed in another field by Martha Minow. And then Alan Dyson and Bram Norwich applied it to education. And Alan um, Dyson explains that the dilemma is created by this um, intention to treat all learners as essentially the same because you want to ensure their rights and an equal and opposite intention to treat them as different, as individuals to respond to their needs. And at the basis of any decision, you'll have that, that dilemma. What Bram Norwich suggests is that for any situation, what you achieve is a resolution. It's not a solution. You find a resolution to that situation, but there will always be pros and cons. There will always be um, other ways, other things that you could have done. Um, I won't go in depth into this because I'm aware of the time as well, but um, it's mainly Bram Norwich developed this idea of dilemmas of difference. And he said it exists in three main areas. First one is identification. It's whether you label students as different as having special needs or additional needs or disability or English as an additional language. Sometimes it's a dilemma for parents. It's a dilemma for teachers. Will they get extra resources if they're labeled? Um, will that bring also some stigma? 
um, in terms of placement, where's the best place to respond to this student? And in terms of curriculum, do you teach the same to that student or do you adapt the curriculum and have a, a different one, different version? So all of these dilemmas are played and are part of the daily, um, the daily routine, the daily um, practice of any practitioner aiming to be inclusive. And this is one of my final um, slides, and it's just to, um, I think it's it's really interesting. It's it has been developed by Kirsten Black Hawkins and Lani Florian, um, and they propose um, ways of research and practice to work together. Um, and I think if I go through them quickly, so if we look at the first one, respect teachers' inclusive pedagogical skills, knowledge, and experiences, but does not idealize them. So if you're a researcher researching in practice, sometimes there's a tendency to look at all the bad things or all the good things. And it's important to acknowledge that classrooms, inclusive education, education, is really complex and you need to be make justice to that in your research, in your write-up of your work. Sometimes as researchers, we want to have a black and white clear picture um, because that will look nice in a, a printed version of our work, but actually we need to be fair to our data. And sometimes it's just very complex and we can't simplify it. Um, it's important that we recognize the difficulties in the students learning, um, that they present dilemmas and that these dilemmas are part of teachers' everyday practice. As researchers, um, and these two researchers emphasize the importance of researchers and practitioners collaborating, bringing research knowledge and craft knowledge of inclusive practice together. And more and more what we see is practitioners who are doing research in their classrooms. They're engaging with student voice, for example, um, and that will create more inclusive um, experiences, environment in which they work. The, the green box tells us something um, in terms of this idea of complexity. There will be methodological difficulties for, for researchers to be able to observe the, the complexity of inclusive practice in action. Um, and also for teachers to articulate their craft knowledge. Um, Mel Ainsko very often talks about thinking on their feet. If you're a teacher, um, you need to think on your feet. You need to respond to what's happening in the classroom. And it's very, very difficult for research to be able to capture that. So finding methodological ways of capturing that is really important. And the final one is the idea that research needs to be meaningful to practitioners and to researchers as well. So again, it's this idea of collaboration. So we started with this question, um, whether um, inclusive education is developed from policy to practice. Um, and with the, the nice diagram from IBE. And I would say that if we think that inclusive education is a process, policy definitely plays a key role in that process. It will influence the concepts we use, the ways we think, the structures that exist, the systems and the practices. But it's not a linear process from policy to practice. Policy enactment is very, very um, messy. Um, and, and so it will be, it's important for us to realize that it will not be, oh, it's written in policy. I would say that most countries will have some form of inclusive policy. Um, if I look at the work from my students and I see um, inclusion being mentioned in educational policy in China, in Greece, in Spain. So it's there in policy. But there will be, as researchers and practitioners, we will know that there will be ch challenges in schools, educations, um, higher education on a daily basis to, to include all students. 
And that's me. And that was a long talk. <laughs> So let me stop share. Oh, thank you, Ines. Um, I think that was a great start for, for the winter school, setting the ground for the conversation that the students will have with themselves, and also with the rest of, of, of the lecturers and, and Globet staff. Um, um, we have like four minutes and five questions uh, recorded. So uh, let, let's do our best. Um, I have Antara on, on the voice of students, Jana on teacher education and professional development, um, Naya on, on, on teacher's practice, Lucia on interpretation of the policy, vocabulary and aims. And, and then Andres on outcomes. So please, um, Andra, you go first. Okay. Um, I basically just want to understand, uh, you said that the choice should always be with the individual, uh, but if it's a specially abled child, and as you said, um, I mean, parents also sometimes don't have the best interest in mind, so uh, who really gets the uh, right to make choices for the child uh, when they're mentally disabled, for instance? And how does that affect the uh, concept of right, rights-based education? Uh, because we know that even uh, children in the general category don't really have the rights that they should have. Thank you, Antara. Uh, we will collect the other questions, so we give some time to Ines to recover from the lecture. <laughs> uh, Jana, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation, first of all. Uh, I think my question is, I think, quite specific around teacher education in terms of, like, how is it possible for teacher education to kind of incorporate the, I guess, the complexity around the intersectionality of oppressions at stake? So I think because, like, I know from Germany, for example, that it's often mostly people specialized on, like, disability or in language. But it's not like that there are professionals on like all anti-oppression, I guess, approaches. So wondering if there's any policies or any like concrete examples where this is trying to be implemented to become more intersectional. Thanks. Thanks, Jana. We go with Naya now. Hello, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, I think at some point you mentioned, I said to teachers that the policies and context might not be inclusive but your practices can be inclusive. And I found it very interesting and empowering for teachers, but at the same time, maybe, just maybe, it takes the focus away from their own impact on policies. Thank you, Naya. Uh, Lucia? Hello, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for your, um, your lecture. Uh, so my question is uh, whether, if we consider the fact that uh, policies tend to be open to interpretations, uh, given the fact that not all actors agree on its terms, as you mentioned earlier, uh, to which extent the lack of clarity on the concepts, uh, on the concepts involved in uh, inclusive um, policies can affect the, the impact of policies in the field. Uh, especially if we consider that uh, policies are going to be implemented in a variety of contexts. Um, so what's the role of policy in considering these aspects? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lucia. And uh, we go with Andres. Mm, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you again for the presentation. And there's just two questions. The first is, you said that inclusive education is understood as a process. So I would like to know how it this change uh, the outcomes or what are the outcomes of that process and in which levels we can understand these outcomes. And also how to deal with this tension that is pretty classic and how context, how countries and in theory has the, has been dealing with this tension between this approach around the contextual the learning process of children as a contextual uh, thing and then uh, that we uh, approach to them based on on their context and then the 
you know, the pressure of these uh, groups and subgroups around uh, particular needs and particular uh, demands and particular uh, proposals. So how, how is this tension between? Thank you, Andres. Um, uh, Ines, is it okay, like five minutes for these answers? I, I, I imagine we'll you could go we'll on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm saying that because then we will jump to the uh, input from five, five students that uh, were asked to reflect on the readings and on the lecture. Uh, so we, we will still have some time after your answer for uh, deeper reflection. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to summarize them. <laughs> um, so the, the first question regarding the voice of children, particularly ch children with, for example, disabilities um, that might have uh, difficulties in communicating their preference. Um, I think, again, the key concept that we need to hang on to is the best interest of the child. So those um, students will probably have, uh, sometimes they have, even as adults, they have legal representatives. And again, it's having that best interest of that individual in mind and your decisions should be made based on that. At the, in general, and I, I get you when you say, look, lots of students don't have a say in terms of their education. I, if I ask my kids whether they want to go to school on a daily basis, they'll say no. <laughs> and now they're home learning and they'll say, I don't want to do spelling. I don't want to write the same word three times. What's the point of this? And the problem is I agree with them. <laughs> I say, there's no point, just write them once. Um, so I think in education, there's a lots of there's lots of things that students still don't have a voice. But I think what we see, um, and when I worked with schools in Portugal, what I saw that was really um, kind of encouraging was when teachers um, worked with student voice in their classroom on a daily basis. Um, and the impact that had on student motivation, behavior, um, well-being, it, it was really, really amazing to see. Um, so I think, yes, the, the best interest, and if I think it's just the awareness that you're deciding for somebody else and thinking, okay, what is your best interest? That then links to big questions. So what's the aim of education? Why do we need schools? What's the aim of life? Do we want to make a lot of money or to be happy? So I think, and that's probably one of the reasons I like inclusive education so much is that it brings all the big questions with it. Um, moving on to the second one, hoping that I'll, I've answered, but we have, I think a little bit more um, debate still. In terms of teacher education, um, if I think of my, for example, the masters that we, we offer in, in Glasgow, we do have, and it's interesting because lots of students do get in touch and say, do you just talk about disability? Um, and we say, no, look, we, we're interested in different things. And we do have students focusing on cultural diversity. Um, last One of the last assignments I marked was on LGBT and creating inclusive classrooms. Um, so I think, there are some examples of this kind of bigger vision of what inclusion is and not just focusing on specific um, groups. But I think also one of the key aspects for teacher education is in-service training, in-service education. It's something that allows teachers, and it doesn't have to be teachers coming to university, but allows teachers to question their practice, to speak to um, collaborate with colleagues and say, look, I've got this challenge. Have you had this? So there's this in-service questioning their practice, reflective, being reflective practitioners, accessing research, which I think will have a huge impact. For that, you need a team. You need to know that it might go wrong, but you've got a head teacher who will say it's okay um, because we can only try um, different things so I think that's in terms of teacher education, that's one of the key key aspects. Practitioner inquiry is something really, really essential. In terms of the teacher's impact um, on policies, I think teachers will have impact on policy depending on where in the world they are. 
they might have impact at different levels. So, for example, if I think of the last policy um, that came out in Portugal, um, the last legislation around education, inclusive education, there was a long process of consultation to develop this. And it was, there were lots of um, interest groups providing opinions. Um, and so there was that side of, okay, practitioners input into national policy, but there will be practitioners input into school policy. So for example, many of the, the students, I can think of at least two in the last year that after um, going through this process of thinking um, about what's going on in their classroom, they went to their schools and did a small practitioner inquiry and ended up changing their school behavior policy. Um, because they felt that the behavior policy was not inclusive. Um, so there's, I think, teacher agency, something really, really important. But again, you need to be supported and collaborate with others. Um, in terms of um, in interpreting, and it links, I think, these two questions link a little bit to, with, with one another in terms of interpreting and this open language and policy. One of the key aspects that we see schools that are have this inclusive ethos, one of the key aspects is school leadership. It's who's um, the, in the heads of schools um, and middle leadership and how they allow their teachers and involve their teachers in this process of interpretation. Um, and by doing this together and support it, um, it will be, it will allow for bigger whole school approaches rather than just an individual's thinking, what can I do in my classroom? Which is also useful and powerful. But if you have whole school approaches, the, the, the impact it will have will be um, much well wider at least with more students um, the last question in terms of um, inclusive education being a process and thinking about the outcomes I think it's it's a process in the sense that you can't really say look oh I'm an inclusive practitioner tick the box and now I can uh, rest because I've I've done this it's this idea that you can always improve. There's always things you can do. And if I think about any class I teach, at the end, I think, did I include everyone? Did I want anyone who wanted to ask a question felt that they could do so? Um, did they feel that if they needed to answer a phone call because it was something really worrying and impacting on their learning, they could do so? Was there a climate of respect? So I think the, the idea of process and questioning your own practice as a practitioner or a researcher is something really important. In terms of outcomes, it's also really important to look at data, for example, um, who are the students who are achieving certain grades in literacy and numeracy? Do they belong to certain groups? Are there over identified um, groups of students? So for example, um, the, the research with um, Artilis, he works with one of the key speakers. Um, he looked at um, the, the over-representation of um, boys from black, so minorities in the US and how they were over-represented in being identified as having special needs. Whereas we know, for example, that if you're black, you're more likely to be identified as having special needs and if you're uh, or to have learning difficulties. And if you're white, you're more likely to be identified as having ADHD and, and autism. And this is something that it's cultural. Um, it's cultural playing a role and it's not OK. And it's something that we need to question. So it's really important to look at outcomes because at the end of the day, we value what we measure. If we say we want everyone to be very inclusive, but then what counts is the results in literacy and numeracy, maybe teachers will not be that motivated to, to get everyone to feel included. So it's important to align the, 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 the outcomes and the measuring and the monitoring to the values that we want to, to make um, happen in schools. 
And the last one, I think that the tension between the, the learning in context versus certain groups of students, um, I think there will always be lobbies pulling teachers one way or another. Um, oh, we can't have a general special education, uh, inclusive education um, supporting everyone because then students with um, severe learning difficulties will be left behind. Um, actually, what we think in general, what we have is this um, within inclusive education, what we, the idea is that if you collaborate with other professionals, if you have a special education teacher in your school and that teacher comes and works individually with one student once a week, I think most teachers, mainstream and special, will feel that it won't have a big impact on that student. If somehow the special teacher and the mainstream teacher ma manage to collaborate, to build knowledge, to build resources together, that will have a much longer standing impact on the experience of that student. So I think, again, it's, it's thinking a little bit, that circle that we had when we talked about inclusion and the circle of the school, it's thinking, is school or is education about that school building? Is it bigger than that? One of the schools that we work in, in Glasgow, um, it's a secondary school and it's really interesting because what they say is our school is not the building, it's the people. Um, we want to be able, so they've got a member of staff that's responsible to communicate with parents um, and they know that there's an open channel always there. Um, they have um, social workers that work with students who, for example, refuse to go physically into the school building um, and they work in local libraries, they go to their houses. So it's thinking about what can we do to ensure that that student accesses learning, not accesses the school building. And that's, I think, the, the kind of the key aspect of inclusive education is it's not about the buildings. It's about accessing learning and succeeding, doing something that you find is meaningful. Thank you, Ines. I think that was it. <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's challenging and, and, and also will be challenging for our discussions. We have five uh, discussions lined up um, and, and you are given like two minutes each to just show your some idea, some reflection. And, and uh, I think it's Jana that goes first, then uh, Ayman, Anna, Alisa, uh, Lucia. I was lucky to be the first one in the alphabet, love it. Um, anyway, um, I would like to reflect a bit on the discourse of, I think, between special and inclusive education. And I think, in some way, I think I very much agree, I think, with what in Florian's text, uh, some another scholar called Alan was mentioning that it's like almost an ethical necessity to reorient towards inclusive education. So in some way, I think really, I think, striving towards like a more holistic approach to inclusivity. But I also really want to mention that I think inclusivity has been this very huge buzzword, especially in policies. I think also, I think it is ten, ten to people brush over all aspects of what it entails by just simply using it as this big word. I think there is some, I guess, positivity or grounding in the idea of using, like keeping special education, I think simply to empower, I think, or like empower the old ways of like trying to remind ourselves that we're not there yet, that we're still like discriminatory, that we're still limiting our, I guess, accessibility. Um, so I think, yeah, in some way, I think I would like to advocate for not shifting so quickly because it, I think it, yeah, at least people behind and it's not, I think, yeah, we're not there yet. I think, especially what COVID has shown in terms of inclusive education. So I think, yeah, just some thoughts. Let's see what the others have to say. Thank you, Jana. Ayman. Um, yeah, so one of the readings, they actually mm -hmm. talked about the um, globalization and migration just a little bit. So I actually have a question, <clears throat> a question based on what on that concept and what uh, you presented in, in the lecture. So my question is because of um, the globalization and we know that people of different nationalities, they keep on migrating and because of this influx of diversity, either it's cultural or language or students' talents or skills or their abilities, these definitions and these concepts, 
they also uh, demand a change. So how do we make sure that we're making policies around these concepts um, that are also sustainable enough in catering uh, the, the need of that change because of this influx every time? Thank you, Ayman. So we have the first comment on the holistic aims of inclusive education now on, on change, educational change. And um, Anna? Yes, well, the issue that I consider to be problematic when it comes to inclusive and special education is the constant focus on the teacher, teacher's accountability and expectations of teachers to mitigate the lack of conceptual clarity as, as actually of terms of inclusive and special education when there are actually very, there is very poor capacity in pre-service trainings. And there is not enough talk about uh, inclusive learning experience through inclusive curriculum and textbooks, because textbooks are basically direct lesson plans for teachers. And the other question that I actually posed and my comment is the stigmatization of students through individualized plans for special education. Uh, and I think they are leading to a greater exclusion uh, because they are simply excluded from participating with uh, their peers in the classroom. And there is a, a huge lack of collaborative learning, which would actually increase the diversity and, and help the inclusion in the classroom. Thank you, Anna. Um, so questions of stigma and teachers accountability also uh, raised by you. Um, Alice? Um, hi everyone. I actually have uh, probably a lot more questions than comments, but I was um, quite puzzled with the idea of creating this versatile approach that um, there are many arguments for in readings um, to create a system that would provide for everyone and not for just most, but then um, how to create a system that um, that basically uh, pushes the everyone to their best limit and um, provides the best achievement. So uh, one of the readings was statement uh, was stating the concept of um, uh, difference is a very ordinary thing and treating everyone is just different, not necessarily uh, students with special needs versus regular students. But at the same time, how can we downgrade or just treat every difference whether it's a socially caused difference or difficulty in learning, or it's a physical impairment, how can we treat it and label it as just a difference? Um, and then maybe uh, deprive some of the students of um, equal opportunities um, and by providing them unique approaches and uh, specialists. So basically my main comment on on this difference and um, um, equality concept is that aren't we trying to aim towards equity more than towards equality? And then why is um, integration such, such an outdated, I would say, concept? And why do we actually need to move towards inclusion if we can just work and focus on working on self-perception of students and not so much on changing um, the approaches towards more common ones. I hope I made sense. Hey, Ali, thank you. Um, so the question of, no, it's great. Uh, multiple um, equalities or inequalities and systemic responses to, to them. I think it's a very good comment. Uh, Lucia, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Okay. Um, my comment uh, goes back to what Jana said about um, uh, the issue of inclusive education being just a buzzword in many instances, um, considering the fact that uh, teacher training is still a problem as studies uh, have shown, and uh, that the idea of uh, inclusion is still very much attached to the issue of access, and instead of the, the issue of you know full participation of these students, and my um, my question is simply shifting the physical spaces where students are like okay in a separate segregated 
uh, special education schools and bringing them into mainstream schools, doesn't it give, give the idea that, okay, the problem does not exist anymore. We don't have to talk about this anymore because now nearly 100% of students are going to mainstream schools. But obviously those students uh, whose voices are not always heard, neither their parents' voices, not always heard, but uh, it, it might be portrayed in the media, as it was mentioned on your paper about uh, um, inclusive education in Portugal, because the media just portrays it in a different way, like, okay, uh, most students are in mainstream schools, but uh, are they fully participating? Do people think it's, okay, the problem is all solved. No need to talk about inclusion anymore because everyone is together. I mean, so that's a concern in a ta uh, takeaway from, from the readings and from our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. And um, very good point on what is problematized and what is not in inclusive education. Um, just, um, I will give the, the, last, the last word to, to, to Ines, but maybe now we can open the floor. And, and I know that you, many of you will have comments and questions. Let me just make the life of our colleagues in Globet more difficult. And let's hear about the academic staff in Globet. Is anyone in, among the teachers willing to say something? Come on, Helen. <laughs> yeah. Your turn. All right, I wasn't... Um writing down the questions. So this is just a general response. I'd like to say thank you very much to Ines for her um, for her virgin lecture. I think it was a very good baseline for the whole of the rest of the week, for the discussions we shall have and the, and the rest of the lectures. And I think she covered a really large ground on what inclusion is, what the problems are today, and uh, gives us a breadth of issues to discuss. Now, we obviously are in the same boat. I mean, we, we agree that inclusion is, um, is uh, an educational goal. We also agree it's an educational dream. Nobody can claim that the, no country no organization can claim they have arrived, they are there, they, they are doing it. It is a process and it is a, there is a mathematical term for this. We are reaching for it all the time. We're not there yet. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should uh, disregard it as an um, unattainable goal because that's the easy solution. And this is what has happened in the past. And this is also what has happened in countries where the legislation or the directives were implemented in practice without the appropriate support. This is one of the mi biggest mistakes we have made worldwide. But if I were to talk about Cyprus, which is the area I research, we had a very a fair, a fair law um, suggesting that we should all participate in the general school and uh, be supported there and only, and only be outside this system if there were very serious reasons for us to be there. So the law in itself is pretty good on paper. Our problem is, as other countries' problem is as well, that the law was not supported. The people working in the system were not supported enough to be able to implement uh, the policy that was stated. So the first reaction, of course, from the system, from the, pra the practitioners in their majority is that this thing doesn't work. We cannot do it. We ex you expect too much of us. We cannot, on top of everything else, have this as well. Okay, now, if you think about it though, you will realize that this is what education should be in the first place. We don't educate everybody so that some of them will achieve educational goals. 
when we send our children to school as parents, we expect, we all expect that they will, they will achieve things, they will achieve academic goals and whether they will do the best they can do. We, we don't send our children to school to fail. So this is a fair demand from society, from parents, that the education system does what it is supposed to be doing, not just go through the motions, but have results, produce results, okay? So the question is not if we shall do it. And it hasn't been for decades now. The question is how we shall do this so that we can achieve the best we can for everybody. It's not easy, nobody said it was, but we're not gonna sit here as policy makers or researchers or professionals, educators and say, so, okay, who shall we exclude so that we can do our job uh, easily with the rest? This, this question is not on the table. It is our job to struggle, to give the best education to everybody and it is the duty of um, the policymakers at many levels. We have duties. The policymakers. Ellen, I will have to interrupt you. Because I'm talking too much. Yeah. Oh, okay, let me finish my sentence. The <laughs> policymakers, the practitioners, the parents, and the children themselves. Okay? So it was a general answer. I thought you wanted me to talk a lot, Oscar. <laughs> oh, it's fine like this. It's great. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> okay, uh, Ines, the, the, you close, please. Okay, so three, three minutes this time, Oscar. <laughs> um, I think, to be honest, I think building up on what Helen was saying, I think at the moment what we have, and that's some of the points that many of you raised, we have countries doing the best they can that they can we've got different settings we've got students who need to be labeled to access resources and we've got students on a daily basis who are excluded from education and what we're saying through this idea of inclusive education is that that's not okay it's not okay to say well I'm sorry you're from a lower social background so we we can't really teach you um because our curriculum is just for people who who've been to museums and seen the beach so sorry um unlucky you so what, what we're saying is that's not okay and that schools um need to change education systems need to change to actually respond to 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 all students who come or sometimes don't come on a daily basis. Um, and I think that for me, the key aspect is that human rights are also a little bit utopic. Um, sometimes we think they're not achievable. We can't achieve all human rights, um, but we're not gonna say, well, let's get rid of them. They're, we will never get everybody to do this or that. What we're saying is, they may be utopic, and I think inclusive education is a little bit the same. It may be a utopic mission, but it's something that we still feel it's a valid mission. Because for me, the thought that some students will be excluded based on their characteristics is not something I can accept. Um, and I agree that teachers are put in a very difficult position and that the support and that the collaboration, the way schools work, needs to be very much rethought. <laughs> um, so, yeah. 